Okay, so let's say that your dad founded a really big oil and chemical company. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, that it's the biggest privately held oil and chemical company in the whole world. The second largest privately held company of any kind in the whole country. And because your dad founded that company, and because dad's will was awesome, you and your brother are now tied in the rankings for the ninth richest men in America. USA, USA. If those were your circumstances, what would make sense uh, is that you, as the head of a giant oil and chemical company you inherited from your dad, uh, you would do things like trying to stop the government from limiting greenhouse gas emissions. You live for greenhouse gas emissions. You'd be trying to make sure there was no tax on fossil fuels. You'd be trying to prevent chemicals like formaldehyde from being labeled as causing cancer. You make many, many millions of dollars, after all, from formaldehyde. You'd be doing all of those things because they would be good for the bottom line of the business that you inherited from dear old dad. Now, chances are, if you were sitting at home watching the show right now, you probably did not inherit a giant oil and chemical company from dad, I'm very sorry. Uh, but the brothers who did, Charles and David Koch of Koch Industries, they have done all of those things that I just mentioned. They have done that advocacy in service of their company's bottom line through the company, through Koch Industries. But they've also funneled a ton of money into organizations with really innocuous sounding names. Groups like Citizens for a Sound Economy. Who's against that? Uh, or Citizens for the Environment. Mmm, sounds like hippies. Uh, there's also David Koch's latest venture, Americans for Prosperity. Who's against prosperity? All of these groups have been started or funded by the Koch brothers, and they just happen to serve the financial interests of Koch Industries. Last summer, we discovered it was groups like Americans for Prosperity that were largely behind all of the supposedly organic grassroots Tea Party rallies around the country. They were paying for the buses, organizing the speakers, putting together training kits for attendees, providing talking points, designing the websites, all that stuff. However legitimate the personal fervency of the activists, Tea Partiers who attended these rallies, particularly the early ones, were essentially instructed to rally against things like climate change legislation by billionaire oil tycoons. But it turns out that in addition to fighting against all of that stuff specifically related to the oil and chemical industry, which makes sense because that's where they got dad's money from, the Koch brothers have also been bankrolling efforts to reduce social services in America, to defeat health reform, to defeat the economic stimulus package for the economy. These are things that may have some vague connection to the bottom line of Koch Industries, but mostly they show that the Koch brothers are pursuing an agenda that is beyond just their own narrow, if very rich, corporate self-interest. They have an interest that is hardcore ideological, hardcore conservative, and dad's money to pursue that agenda turns out um, goes a long, long way. Joining us now for the interview tonight is The New Yorker's Jane Mayer, author of Covert Operations, The Billionaire Brothers Who Are Waging a War Against Obama. Jane Mayer, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Great to be with you, Rachel. So let me ask you about the distinction I made in the introduction. It, it seems like a lot of what the Koch brothers have funded has a direct impact on Koch Industries' profitability. But can you describe for us the more ideologically motivated stuff that they've been funding? Well, sure. I mean, the, the, the two interests do dovetail to a large extent, but they are very hardcore libertarian ideologues, and they have been for many years. And um, their, their early years, actually, are very revealing. I go into the family story to some extent in this piece in The New Yorker. And um, they, they were early backers of and followers of a man named Robert Lefevre, who was really an anarchist um, and, and believed that that the government should be completely decimated, basically. He, the, the only thing he believed in was a government that would protect individual rights. And so from those early days, they were supporters of, of getting rid of things like Social Security, uh, income taxes, all kinds of regulations. They wanted to get rid of the FBI, the CIA. Um, they, they are... It's, it's a, Charles Koch, who is interestingly one of the, the heads of one of the most uh, important and influential companies in the country, is also a man who's described himself quite recently as a radical. And so it's a radical ideology they have. One of the things that is striking is the distance between the sort of John Birch era um, 
Coke the father ideology that you described and modern day, even very far right conservatism. For example, the idea of getting rid of the FBI and the CIA is something that would strike a lot of today's modern sort of national security conservatives as um, kind of off the deep end, right? Well, it would, but I mean, they are extreme libertarians. In fact, they are the major funders of, of libertarianism in the country, and they have been for an, a number of years. But at, at a certain point, the two things collide quite nicely for them in that, that, that what they have been spending a lot of money on is um, fighting regulations on things like, as you've mentioned, the environment. And um, they've got a history of, of, of serious pollution problems and even some criminal problems having to do with their pollution record. And um, so when they go after the federal government, they're also aiding their bottom line. The strategy of the brothers um, has been to try to influence policy by bankrolling a lot of right-wing think tanks, a lot of right-wing organizing outfits. Why did they determine that that was the best route to take? I know that you describe in the piece how one of them at one point ran for office. Well, that's true. It was really interesting. In 1980, um, David Koch, the brother who lives in New York City, uh, became vice president of the Libertarian Ticket. and. Um, Actually, it was interesting. If you take a look at that campaign, the language was much like the Tea Party now. They even talked about having a Tea Party then um, to, to get rid of taxes. But, but at any rate, it was a flop at the ballot box. Um, if they, uh, they got something like 1% of the vote, and they realized they couldn't really win in kind of the open democratic marketplace. So instead, they decided to go uh, recede from public view and start funding a complete apparatus of public opinion that would push America in their direction in other ways. And um, there's a, a, a book about them um, and about the libertarian movement called Ra Radicals for Capitalism, in which um, they are described as deciding that, that, it, that politicians were just actors and it would be better to write the scripts for the politicians than to be the politicians. So people that started writing the scripts were the think tanks that they started funding and the academics that they started funding and um, some of the pundits that they started funding. One of the things that's most intriguing about them is that until recently you've heard so little about them. They've really taken sort of great pains to keep their own names out of the headlines to do this in a very low key way. Do you have any insight into why they haven't been more transparent about their political donations and, and what they're trying to do? Well, one of the people who worked with them for a long time who uh, talked to me said that, that they prize their privacy partly because they think it helps their bottom line. Um, one of the things that they, they really don't want is to be in the center of political controversy because, for instance, they make an awful lot of household products that everybody knows in this country. Things like brawny paper towels and Dixie cups and stain master carpet and Lycra and you know, all, all kinds of things that uh, Georgia Pacific lumber, plywood, these things we're all familiar with and they don't, I'm told, really want to have the public connect those products to their extreme politics. And um, it, you know, it also might bring congressional investigations if they were in the news more. So they try to be way behind the scenes. I did notice that um, I, I was sort of scanning your piece at first, looking to see if anybody in Democratic politics or in the administration was going to weigh in on this subject. We've been sort of talking about the Koch brothers and Americans for Prosperity since the early days of the Tea Party. We didn't go anywhere near as deep as you went in this piece for The New Yorker. But I was very interested to see that you got a comment from David Axelrod about them. I, I wondered if you got the sense that the administration, the Obama administration, is frustrated with the influence of the Koch brothers, if they want there to be uh, more public awareness of what they're doing. You know, I mean, I can't really speak for the White House, but I, I, I get the feeling that they, what they're frustrated about is that, that, that the Tea Party's been able to um, be portrayed through most of the media, not necessarily yours, because you've done a terrific job on, on covering Americans for Prosperity, but, but, but many places it's been considered a kind of a, a spontaneous uprising that just came from nowhere. And there is certainly for real anger out there in the country. But what I think is frustrating for the White House, from what I can see, is that, that very few people have connected the dots to explain the corporate interests that are organizing a lot of it and who are trying to exploit it in many ways, push their own agenda, organize people so that, as you mentioned, they will start rallying against things like cap and trade policy and energy. These are issues that are pretty abstruse issues to many people. They're not usually the kinds of bread and butter issues that people go out in the 
street for, but there are big issues for fossil fuel industries, and, and they're pushing the Tea Party in that direction. AstroTurf is, after all, a petroleum product. <laughs> it should be, we should be reminded. <laughs> Jane Mayer, author of the must-read piece on the Koch brothers in the latest issue of The New Yorker. Uh, it's linked at our blog at Matto Blog today. Jane, thanks very much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.